I'm stuck in this box. <laughs> Are we live? Yeah. Hold on, the cord just fell off the <laughs> microphone thing. Oh, that's not good. Oh. All right. I think we're good. All right, we're good. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the CG Cookie live stream. Uh, as we always start these, or I'm sorry, I'm so mind blackled right now. <laughs> Uh, we do these every Wednesday at 2 p.m. And today we're going to be doing subsurface scattering, which uh, is something that I feel is very important when you're doing any material or texture. So hopefully we will dive into that enough for you guys to understand. It's a really cool effect that you can add to your materials. So once you kind of understand how it works and why it's doing what it's doing, then you can go ahead and add it to the materials that do subsurface scattering. But as we start off these streams, we always want to know where you're watching from. So Joe will be doing shout-outs. Shout-out time! All right. Uh, Beatrice says hi from Belgium. Uh, Michael, Micah says, yes, I'm finally free from college today because of a tornado. Oh, dang. Yeah. Hopefully you don't get taken away by the tornado. That wouldn't be cool. Um, Evie says, good evening from Germany. It's not ease. Uh, Andrea says hi from Denmark. Sean Diamond says hello from over the rainbow. <laughs> well, hello from Kansas. Uh, Tigel wants me to speak in my best Dutch. That I. It says, guys, thanks for everything. You are the best. Have a nice stream. In in Dutch. So, ha! Gotcha. Uh, Jonathan Miller says, hi from Indiana. Uh, Fabian says, hello from the Netherlands. I'm not just says Sweden. That's it. Just. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I did ask where they're watching from. Uh, Renato says, ciao from Italy. Lotus No More says, where did it go? It just moved on me. I went to click on it. There it is. Uh, hi from New Jersey. Do, 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 do. Artist Chris says hello from Norway. And then they have a question, but we can we can answer that question after we start up. Um, and Smoke Illustrator says hello, Tim and Joe. Greetings from Belgium. We have a lot of people from Belgium. It's all that digital influence. Yeah. Uh, Jamil says, hey, how are you guys doing? I'm doing great from Michigan. I'm, I'm doing pretty good. It's, it's really uh, dreary out. Is that the right word? Dreary? Mm -hmm. Or just like everything's gray. No sun. I don't think I've seen sun in the past two days. Uh, Hitachi Maya says, hello, everybody. I'm new here. Uh, is this stream, will this stream begin soon? Yes. <laughs> uh, Sandra says hi from St. Cloud. Uh, been watching for several months and finally chiming in. Well, thank you. Thank you for chiming in. And then two more. Ruka, Ruka Angel says the Netherlands. And Ian Falcon says hello from Canada. Hello, everyone. Hello out there in TV land. Been a little crazy the past, like, three days. I have a material and texture course coming out next week, and it's been interesting, to say the least. But I will show you guys in the stream the material studies that I've done and what you can expect to see in the tutorials. So that's why today is just a little jumbled. But we have... a. Uh, a good one for you today. I'm keeping my ears open. Okay, one more. I just got to do one more thing, and then I'll be ready. All right. All right, there we go. All right, welcome, everyone, to the CG Cookie live stream. I'm Tim Von Rieden, and I'm joined by Joe Chico. Hello, everybody. And these are live streams done every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Central Time, and that's minus 5 GMT. 
And we usually post what we're going to do about an hour or two beforehand on the community, Facebook, DeviantArt, Twitter, Tumblr, all that good stuff. And today we're doing subsurface scattering. And it's specific for a material because all through November, the live streams have been focused on material studies. And if you're interested in the ones that we did, I think last week was show so shiny in Chrome. It was, a, or no, it was Chrome and gold. gold. And then the one before that, is too far for me to remember. Uh, but <laughs> today, uh, we're going to be focusing on candles, specifically wax, and uh, human skin, more specifically the ear. And uh, I wish I could swivel the camera around, but we have a bunch of material stuff that we got for the course coming out next week. And uh, it varies from like pearls, candles, a bunch of sphere and square stuff. We're going to be doing some spray painting later today. Uh, to get the effect of gold. Actually, I can show you what we have. So for the sphere studies, we're going to be spray painting these uh, ornaments, the glass ornaments. And we got to do a double coat because we got to make sure it's completely getting the surface area of whatever spray paint we're doing. And we're going to see if the gold looks like gold and the chrome spray paint actually looks and feels like chrome. Otherwise, we might have to find a gold sphere somewhere. But uh, we're very excited to share it with you. Uh, one of the materials I'm really excited to do, and I think I might actually do this for the live stream next week, this is called, or at least what I've been calling, a special material. This is iridescence. Um, I'm sure you've seen it on uh, random places. Usually it's on like gift bows or uh, <laughs> really that's mainly the area that I see it most. But uh, the, the cool thing about this iridescence is how it treats lighting, and it reflects purple and green. But uh, most people would describe it as a pearl color, but it's basically just purple and green based on wherever the lighting's hitting it. So there's a lot of cool material studies that will be in this course, and it'll be a growing course. So I think it'll be like every few months, I'll add like a liquid material pack. It'll be like a booster pack, and it'll have like water, blood, wine, and something that you guys request. So I think the course, when it comes out next week, will have just a few, and then it will just keep growing upon itself. All right. Uh, before I start the stream, I wanted to show you guys what subsurface scattering looks like behind an ear. Or what it is, I guess, sh should be how we should start it. Subsurface scattering is pretty much when light permeates through an object, and there's enough uh, interference in the object where it bounces around and you can see the light bouncing. It's not like glass where it passes right through and then you can see it uh, land in the shadow, but uh, what subsurface scattering does is it creates this like glow, an inner glow, because when a light bounces on itself, it becomes more saturated. And that's why an ear looks super red, or like if you hold up an orange or a clementine to light, it always appears much more orange or it like glows as you know, faint yellow light. And to test that with you guys, specifically on the ear, I'm going to turn the flashlight on on my phone, and it's going to create this really weird look behind my ear. And you can do it on any part of your skin where it's thinner, so sometimes even your hand if you hold it up to the sun, but more specifically if you had like a flashlight and you held it right up against your fingers. I'm hoping you guys can see this at least a little bit. But you can see the, oh, there we go. All that pink and red color is pretty much that light bouncing around in, I mean, it might sound kind of gross, but you're, it's the blood that the light is bouncing around, and that's why it creates this fleshy pink uh, glow. But what I thought was cool about this camera phone, or this uh, light specifically, is it's so intense in such a little area that when you hold it, let's say, behind my ear, it's going to create this really crazy effect. Let me see. I want to make sure you can actually see it. All right. So you can see how I become like a science experiment. <laughs> and uh, the light is actually even bouncing all the way to the front part of my head. You can even see it like on my finger as a rim light. So on areas of the skin that are really thin, the light will just like permeate right through. And then it acts almost more like glass where the light then will be captured in the shadow area. And uh, we have a lot of pictures that we're going to share with you during the stream as well. Uh, we're going to take even more. We bought a, uh, what are those, a photo booth light setup. So we're going to be taking some high quality 
uh, macro photos of different materials and we're going to specifically try to get materials that have subsurface scattering so you can see the effect uh, not only with skin but in weird objects that maybe you wouldn't think of uh, initially and it's usually the best uh, for me at least the best materials to see it with are uh, like fruits and not so much veggies but uh, skin is another big one and then things like cheese uh, it's very strange, but once you see the effect, you're like, oh, that looks really cool. And once you paint it, you're, you feel like you can add in this cool effect uh, subtly in areas to kind of heighten a sense of realism. Okay. And I <laughs> I'm using the surface scattering in my nose. That's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, if you guys have a little little light on your phone. I would even do some tests and take photos, and it might look really weird when you're taking the photos, but uh, it's, a, it's a really cool reference to use. We're gonna be painting an ear. It won't have like an extreme subsurface scattering, but we're gonna do more of a subtle one that is uh, more realistic in a way that like if sun was behind you, not so much like a really intense uh, camera light right behind you. All right, let me switch over to my canvas here. Oh, Sean Diamond says that it was uh, leather the first week. Ah, thank you. Okay, let me get that bottom bar out of here. Okay, so about two or three years ago, we did a candy study, and I think the reason this one resonated so much with people was mainly the gummy bear. And people seemed to really enjoy the idea of Oops, let me get my new layer going. Come on. There we go. So the idea that the light actually pools on the bottom of the object and then the area that is closest to the surface, closest to the actual source material of the light, is actually the darkest and the, le the most dull in terms of saturation but it has this reflected light on the very surface where the area that it pulls up on the very bottom and then it gets casted into the shadow is actually still more saturated than the area. Or no, I'm sorry, the gummy bear is still more saturated even in the darker area than in the shadow area, and that makes sense. And the reason that I want to use this kind of an example is because it really creates this awesome glow effect to the material we're working with. So we even took some more photos of gummy bears specifically, of course. Actually, we have a few. But it just kind of goes to show you that and these were smaller gummy bears, and that's why there isn't as much light in the shadow as in the last example. example but you're still getting that small pool of color on each of them in the shadow area. And that's something to pay attention to. And we have this hard candy example. And this will actually be one, it might be one of the materials in the final course. I can show you guys what that looked like. I've been doing so many uh, random tests with materials. Ah, there we go. So this is my hard candy one, and it was done on a white background. That's why we got that look to it. And part of the material course that's coming out next week is I believe if you're able to do it or create a material in the four basic forms of a cube, a sphere, a cylinder, and a cone, then you should be able to recreate that in any complex shape. So the idea behind the course is uh, it challenges you to take, let's say, a hard candy material and then recreate it in the four forms and then choose a more complex shape to then further your understanding of the material and try to apply it to that complex shape. So even right now, the one that I have been killing myself over right now, uh, I can show you guys, is this frosting. It's like a frosting 
Uh, I know I was talking to my Australian friend. Uh, you guys might not have these circus animals crackers overseas, but I think they called them frosted biscuits with thousands or hundreds and thousands on them, but we call them sprinkles. Uh, these are, this is the first example of what we want to do for the course. And it's basically the idea of going through the material, figuring out does it absorb or reflect light? Are the highlights isolated or diffuse? Is the surface texture smooth or rough? Find your base color or the hue identity of the material, then recreating the four forms. Now, the next one that I'm going to be doing is a complex form, and I'm going to actually try to make a frosted hand, and we're going to hopefully test that out later tonight. So hopefully that goes well. But the next one I'm doing after this is going to be a subsurface scattering one, and I think that's why I wanted to do it for this uh, live stream as well. So now, I tried to find as many little materials as I could, uh, just even around the house that we could take uh, photos of for subsurface scattering. And there are uh, a lot more than I actually expected. And this little gem thing, you can see, once again, you can have that darker pooling, and then it becomes more saturated here. And then the color actually falls into the shadow itself. Now, it depends on how reflective the surface is, because this example is much more different than this example, and it's even more different than the gummy bear example. And even with the gummy bear, you can see how, yeah, it's reflecting some of that neutral coating light on the surface, but it's not reflecting the area enough where you can actually see like what's going on in the room. Whereas in with this gem example, you can kind of see the reflection of the room itself that this object is sitting in. So don't just always assume a subsurface scattering object is this almost like neutral. Uh, it, it's like a mixture of absorbing and reflecting light. Sometimes it can be more highly reflective, or sometimes it can be more on the absorbing light side. So there isn't like one specific way to describe a material that has subsurface scattering. But the best way to look at it is if the light passes through the surface or it permeates it, and there is a there's like a density. I'm trying to think of the right word. It's not clouded. Oh, there's interference. I'm sorry. There's interference that the light can then work with, and it just bounces on each other, or bounces on itself, and that's what creates that look. All right. So enough of me talking. Oh wait, no, I have three more examples. Uh, this was the example of skin where it's not as intense as like the ear or the nose one that Joe did. But I woke up, and I think this was last week, and this like highlight was just on my hand. It looked so bizarre. So I took a picture of it. And you can see the subsurface scattering happening. Right There's like a gradient from white and then this yellow color right next to the light. Then it becomes this like pinky saturated color. And then as it gets closer to my actual skin color, it becomes less saturated. And that's when you can kind of color test and see where those colors lie on the USB slider and how that affects the skin with this intense light. And uh, this is just one of many examples of subsurface scattering. Here was a pumpkin I did last year. And the light is behind the surface, and it's a pumpkin. So when you scrape off the skin, it's left with uh, this, I don't even know how to describe the inside texture of the pumpkin. But it's like if you, uh, what is a material that's close to the inside of a pumpkin? It's like if you skinned an apple. It's kind of similar to that. And the light is able to pass through, and it creates this glow because it's taking into account the light and then the slight orange of the pumpkin, and then it just like amplifies it. And then the areas that are more black are the areas where the skin of the pumpkin is still left. And then the last one I have is one that was actually in the color course, and it was talking about the where saturation happens and how areas that are in light are you typically less saturated than areas in shadow. And this was just me. Uh, I think the light was coming from underneath, and I just took a picture of um, my my fist when it was clenched in the inside. And you can see the really cool effects that it gives off with the subsurface scattering inside of the skin itself. 
Okay, what were the other examples I have here? Oh, these are ones that I quickly found on the internet. So this grape one, great example. Uh, the movie Paranorman, uh, one of the big things that was always talked about were his ears, and they were so thin compared to the rest of his body and his features that you could almost always see the light permeate through the ear and create this glow on either side of the head. And I, I personally love that effect, and especially because it's reflecting how that actually works in real life. That's why I found this. I think this is a dog ear, and you can see that same effect where it's passing through the ear, and it creates a soft little glow that wouldn't have been there if the light source wasn't uh, behind it. And then one of my favorite artists created just a bunch of these. This is just one of many of uh, their studies where they do like these really isolated studies of subsurface scattering and they'll have like a singular light in the scene and then just have your hands and your feet and put in these positions where you can clearly see the subsurface scattering. And if you saw this normally, you might think this is very bizarre, but our mind knows that this is subsurface scattering happening so it allows this like fantastical color selection to feel realistic, even though uh, when we think skin, we probably don't think this super vibrant orange color. And then the last one was this wax sculpture. And that's going to be one of the examples. I'm going to be drawing a candle for you guys. And it's the idea that uh, the, the thinner the material is, if it allows for this subsurface scattering effect, usually that's where the light will be more intense. So you can see the thinner areas, especially on the edge, have more of this lighter glow, almost like a highlight to it. And then the area in the center where it's more dense is more dark and it's more, or it doesn't allow the light to pass and bounce through as much as the, the outer part. It's almost like a thin membrane is so much easier for the light to pass through than like a solid brick of, of wax. All right, so let's go ahead and start doing some drawings. And I'm sure there are a few questions lined up. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to do, do like a quick sketch of, or you know what, maybe we'll do the candle first. The, um, this, there's someone in the chat that's saying that it's not transparent, but it's translucent. Sorry, translucent. Yeah. And then transparent. I also needed to look up what the heck the name of the pumpkin was that the inside of it, that part that you're talking about. Oh, what is it? It's the hypanthium, which is <laughs> which is I and that's an, an apple. I imagine it's the same thing, the pumpkin, but it's the flesh formed by fusion of the basis of of it, and it's fused with the wall of the object. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. <clears throat> All right, so if you want to ask a few questions, I'm just going to outline and start the base of the candle. All right. Um, I'm not asks, I've gotten some flack on Reddit just for using DeviantArt, and I've heard a bit about <clears throat> a bit of dislikes about the homepage from other sources. What's your thoughts on DA, and why do you think people rag on it? To be honest, I, I don't understand it anymore, because I used to really uh, kind of be on that same page when I first started art school of like, oh, DeviantArt is whatever. It's not uh, for a professional mindset. But now that I think I'm older and I've seen the site mature and even myself, my mentality has matured about it. I really like DeviantArt. I check it, I would say, every day. And I, I know that there is a lot of art that is uploaded that may not be the highest quality, but I kind of see it like uh, you have to sift and search through a lot of the not so good art to find the diamonds in the rough. And it's really easy when there's a filter on the front page where you just say, like, the most popular in the last 24 hours. And typically, every time I go to DeviantArt, it's usually pretty good art on the front page. So I've always been more of a supporter of DeviantArt. And I think I, I will continue to do, uh, be that. Just 
Street Dragon ninety five says the light demonstration. I'm all ye ears. <laughs> uh, Ari Phillips asks, "Do you guys get nervous in these streams?" Uh, not anymore. I think I used to, but now I think my mind is always racing with things that I need to be doing as soon as the stream ends. <laughs> That uh, I try to come to these in, in more of like a relaxed mindset, and I'm able to like talk to you guys. I was gonna say when it comes to moderating, it's it's pretty chillax, not really nervous. Uh, but when I'm when I'm drawing, like I notice that I'm trying to do three things at once, so my brain has to <laughs> say filler words like um and uh. <laughs> Finding quick reference photos of Candle on a second screen here. Uh, Kari Sada asks, have you ever tried to draw with your non-dominant hand? It's so hard. Yes. Actually, uh, one of my newer art friends, Gawky, she and I were at this light drawing session, and her challenge was you have to draw this entire model on this pose with your left hand. Actually, no, Joe did it too. And it was interesting. <laughs> It was one of those things where you realize how much stronger you are with your other hand, and you your mind knows what to do, but it's like trying to get your hand to physically do what your mind wants, and it's like this weird struggle and miscommunication. There we go. Okay. Uh, Michael Tisdale asks, Hey, Tim, have you seen One, my, one Punch Man yet? Huh. My friend literally just recommended that show to me. I, I watched the first episode, and I can s definitely see where the humor is coming from. So I know recently I got wrapped up into, what was that show called? Over the Garden Wall, and I finished that whole season. And I think right now I'm not focused on watching any new seasons until I get this course out, and I'm going to stick to the B movies that Netflix has to offer for the next <laughs> week or two. <laughs> Yeah, definitely want to check it out. People have been raving about it. <clears throat> uh, EVE says, I'm usually somewhat all right with replicating materials and other shapes than the reference, but as soon as there's some other light conditions, I'm kind of lost. What can I do to improve on that? So typically that comes to identifying the local color. And you know what? I might write this on the side. So I want you guys to know that there's a huge difference between local color and the hue identity of an object. So the hue identity, let's say, of this candle would be this color. It's kind of like the base color that you're using to represent the material before you add in your lights and shadows. And the local color will can be greatly affected and will change the hue identity uh, dramatically. So let's say that this candle was in like a rock show environment where it's like completely dark and then they have a bunch of strange light effects going on. So the only light in the room is like this green light. Well then the local color, let me go ahead and the local color of the candle now becomes this greenish color because that's the only light source in the scene. So it's mixing with the hue identity to create this new base color. So to create your base color, you need to think of the scene that it's in, the hue identity, and if there's a local color. And typically, the local color might not be as intense as this green, but let's use another example. Let's say it was in a room that was incredibly dark. We're going to make the background darker here. All right, so if there's very little light in this room, immediately I hope that you guys can recognize that the hue identity of this candle should not be uh, this color. The, the local color is going to be affected by the light source, and since there's very little, the candle itself oops, won't be green. It will be this, will be almost a darker version of the initial hue identity. 
you know what? We might stick with this as we go on because I, I like uh, doing this like dark candle or dark scene that this candle is in. It better explains stuff server scattering as well. OK. So now the local color of this candle would be more of the second color. So whenever you're adding a light in your scene, I know that this is it's really easy to say, but it's harder to do in practice. But whenever you add in a light source, you really have to take into account how that affects everything in the scene that you've added and keeping it consistent. So be very aware that if you have a candle in or whatever the material or subject matter is, but in this case, it's a candle. If we had this candle in this dark scene, uh, it wouldn't fit. It would stand out like a sore thumb, and you would have to adjust the local color on the hue identity of our candle here. And uh, in a second, I'm going to show then when you add in the candle light, how you have to take that into account and how that affects the material of the wax. So let me go ahead and make this candle look a little nicer before we go ahead and add in the flame. So yeah, we can get the next question in. All right. Uh, chuk, chuk, chuk. Stephen Walker asks, or asks, how do I learn best to draw things more precise digitally? Because I get to the point where I'm just not able to add more detail, and then I don't know how to continue. Uh, to be honest, it, it does become a little tricky or when you're doing it digitally. But eventually, it'll become more of a, like, in it's, it becomes easier, in my opinion, to do something uh, digitally when you're doing like precise detailing. Unless if you're doing like line art, I still think line art with traditional medium seems to be much easier for me than in digital. But in terms of like detailing or like adding texture or creating more of a glow effect, I, I really do believe it's so much easier digitally. So if you get to the point, let me reread the question where I'm just not able to add more detail. Ah. Uh, I, I think that comes to your visual eye then at that point. And if you can see that it should have more detail in it, then you need to practice on why it doesn't look like it has enough detail in it yet. And uh, this might be a point where you should ask someone that you trust and that can acknowledge where your, uh, your flaws might be or where you could push or amplify different areas of your piece better. Man, I, I know how much of a pain that can be when you can see that it doesn't look the way you want, but you don't know how to get there. And it's crossing that gap or bridging that gap that can be usually the biggest struggle. But don't let it, don't let it defeat you. Just know that you can get better with this detailing process. You just have to figure out what that process is. So don't focus so much on the details. Focus more on the process itself. <clears throat> Dave T asks, Tim and Joe, for how long should an artist practice and study value before going on to color? That's another interesting question because uh, I've never just specifically studied values uh, in my life, I would say. I did it naturally when I was doing pencil drawing, but whenever I went digitally, I would always use color like right from the get-go. So I don't think there is like a specific point. I th definitely think it varies per artist on what they're more comfortable with, or what their uh, what their strengths actually are. I do think having a great understanding of values will just improve the the color that you're adding and the uh, the the way that the forms actually look. Uh, I think we focus too much on value, and I, I go much more into the into this with the color course, but. We focus so much on the brightness rather than also focusing on the hue and saturation to create contrast. And if you have a strong sense of contrast through brightness, you should be able to carry that over into using color and working with the hue of the color and the saturation as well. And I think that you should be doing a practice of both. Because if you focus so much on value, I, I think that you're not grasping uh, color harmonies and the way that colors 
work with each other, you're focusing more on creating form, which is really good. I don't want to downplay how important that is too. But I don't think there's a point where you just switch. I think you should always be doing both. Toby Fox says, I'm curious, how tall are you guys? I am 4'12". And I am 7'2". <laughs> I'm going to take that liner out. <laughs> and then, oh, where's that wick? There we go. All right, I'm going to go to the bottom. Check out some of these older questions. Started from the bottom, now we're here. Oh, artist Chrissy. Uh, how do you get so much depth to your pieces? I try to add depth, but I never get to the level I want. It's kind of like what we were just talking about. It's probably you don't have enough contrast. And you might be focusing too much on brightness contrast. Uh, if you aren't a citizen member, well, if you are a citizen member, I would just watch the color course because I go into detail on how to use saturation and hue as a contrast effect to create form and value and not just relying on value and brightness. But I think with my pieces, I try to, at least I try to always consider using all three, using brightness, hue, and saturation to create contrast. And in essence, you're creating form, and you're separating forms from one another, and that's why it creates this atmosphere that feels like uh, the items are separated from one another. But the, the tricky part is keeping it consistent and always always keeping in mind where your light source is coming from if you have a light source and making sure that it feels represented everywhere in every area of your piece. Soren asks, what software are you drawing in? I am working in Photoshop CC, but I've worked in CS4, CS5, and 6 before. And then uh, New Moon Gazelle asks, what brushes do you use for this? If you said it that in the beginning, forgive me, I just joined in the stream. That's all good. Uh, for the live streams, I typically stick with the basic brushes. So for what I'm going to be using today, it's pretty much a hard edge brush, hard edge brush, <laughs> a soft edge brush, and that's it. <laughs> I, I really do believe that if you can master working with the basic brushes, then uh, using the more advanced or tricky looking brushes is more of a time saver. It's more efficient, but it's not uh, a crutch at that point. And I'll be putting up the uh, link to those basic brushes from the Siege Cook set at the end of the stream. Beautiful. Uh, Beatrice asks How would you indicate subsurface scattering when you're sketching? or painting really rough? Uh, when you're sketching, if you're doing it traditionally, it's actually pretty hard. Uh, you have to work with your brightness. If you're working traditionally with like pencils, you got to like think about how that intense saturation is actually lightening up the area. So it's a little harder doing it with pencil and paper. But if you're doing like a quick sketch, let me do so you guys can kind of see what that looks like. Now, mind you, this is not my forte, so don't judge me too hard. But if I was to do a quick candle with subsurface scattering, I would look at how the light is affecting the surface. I'm not so much focusing on the details, how pretty it looks. Oh, this is very weird for me. Hold on. <laughs> And the idea is to uh, be bold and be very strong with your placement of your brush strokes. So I can find more of a yellow. So 
would look something probably like this. And then, oop, let me grab. And I would have a slight gradient, or as my roommate would say, an ombre effect. Ombre. And it has this more dull appearance the further away from the light sources is. So the closer it gets, it would have uh, this more saturated look. You can see how it's still pretty rough, and we're trying to keep it similar to that style. Like I said, I don't typically do this kind of a quick style, so I know that this could be done better. And if you want to see like a master uh, representation of doing something like this, uh, Tonko House is like a little company I'm obsessed with, and they did an entire short animation called The Dam Keeper, and it almost relies on this. Qu it looks really rough and quick, but there is so much thought and. Uh, precision with their brush strokes and how they work with lighting that it, it's actually like a master study really of uh, color and light but this would be my quick version of how to do it rough I was gonna say it also depends on what object you're trying to paint or sketch right yes because like not every object is gonna have this subsurface scattering look to it but Light will affect every material ever. <laughs> it just depends on does it reflect, does it absorb it, is there a mixture of the both? If so, then you have to think about, well, is light bouncing around the object, or is it just passing through? Is it showing in the shadow? And it becomes kind of fun, and the more that you do a bunch of different studies, it becomes very second nature. You don't even have to think about it. So then, like doing a candle, you should already know where the placement of light would be, how that would affect the wax underneath it where the saturation would go. And then it becomes more fun. <laughs> say, say N says, if you are 7'2", there are some things on the roof I need you to reach up and get for me. <laughs> I have Photoshop CS6. Is CC better comparatively? And does it have any new functions? Yeah, that's not that I've noticed, really. <laughs> uh, it, until they do something very drastic, like if they added a line, uh, what's that called? The smoothing. Uh, wait, which one are you talking about? Not an equalizer. Lazy Nazumi. Oh, yeah, what about? A line stabilizer. Oh, okay. Yeah, if they added that, that would be like, okay, there's a huge difference with the new CC. But no, I haven't really noticed any big one. I think one of the bigger ones was the the color panel. Like, you can make that big and small now. I think that was one of the bigger ones from CS6 to CC. <laughs> like, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, exciting. Uh, Ari Phillips says, I am skilled when it comes to copying things. Uh from life and photo reference, but as soon as it comes to imagination, it's really bad. I do a lot of fantasy, and sometimes I don't know what reference aspects to search, or if there, if there is for what I am doing. Uh, you might be what my art teacher used to call me so offensively, which is more of like a photocopy machine. And I want you to know right now, you are not <laughs> that. I think you're just very observant, and you're very good at seeing what's in front of you and being able to replicate or recreate it. So the challenge for you is then uh, putting it into practice and applying that knowledge into something that you don't have a direct reference for. And that's actually one of the reasons for the material and texture course why I'm not only doing like a draw what you see and like apply this to these different forms, but then take it a step further and do a more complex shape. So when I do the hand study of this frosting material, I, I know what a hand looks like, and I know what this material, uh, how it represents itself in terms of like how does it handle light and the color, everything, and or the surface texture, literally everything. I, I understand it, and now I have to apply that knowledge to the more complex form. So my tip to you, or at least my challenge to you, would be to take this knowledge that you, you feel you have and then apl apply it. So 
I guess that would be that would be it. Uh, take the knowledge that you have and then apply it to a more complex shape that you don't have reference to. Okay, I'm going to have two versions of this candle. Oh, you know what? No, first I'm going to light it. So on the first candle, we're going to light this candle. <laughs> Just like match noise. Oh. <laughs> Oh, here's my, my Zippo lighter. There you go. There. We lit it. <laughs> <laughs> there. Uh, Satnam asks, how late am I? <laughs> Not too late. I, you're about halfway halfway through the stream? I was going to I was gonna make a, a pregnancy joke, but I was like, nah. <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, do, 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 do. Smoke Illustrations asks, why don't you sell your color course on DVD? We used to sell courses on DVDs when I actually first started at CG Cookie. And I think it just became uh, more obvious or more apparent that people would just rather watch it digitally than have to wait uh, to get in the mail. And then I know even like Mac's really pushing this no CD-ROM future. So like I can't even watch DVDs. DVDs on my computers or uh, a Blu-ray or anything. I'd have to like get an adapter to even watch a movie. So I think that's the main reason, just because I I know that's uh, the direction CG Cookies taking. But I wouldn't be surprised if we sold the color course individually uh, in the future. If you didn't want to get the whole membership, but just uh, watch the course itself. Uh, Lotus No More says, those sound like really, really effective exercises. I can't wait to try those material. Try it with the material course. It's To be honest, I thought I would be able to like whip through it. It is it is actually quite the challenge. And I think it's even challenging the way I thought about uh, creating materials quickly. And it just reminds me that you can't rush uh, something to look uh, like quality. And it, I think it's a really, really good practice for you guys and me and really literally any artist that wants to become more or at least stronger in their material uh, sense. And I think this frosting one is just driving me up a wall uh, just because of like all the little sprinkles and making each one feel like they, they're actually like setting in the frosting. They're not just like laid on top. So yeah, I hope you guys enjoy it as much as I've had fun kind of creating it. It can be really addicting too. It can be really addicting. When I was just doing just the studies and I wasn't having to record myself, I was like, I was having a blast. You know, I was having fun. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm just like crying. <laughs> uh, wait, let me find the. Where is it? I can share with you guys the five that I did before I recorded. And I was like, yeah, this is going to be amazing. Where are the, is my wood one? I didn't see the wood one, that one looks awesome. And then where's my, my gummy one? Yeah, so these are the five that I did and I was just like, oh, I can't wait to record all of these. And then I start the frosting one. And uh, for those of you that record or like do uh, recordings of yourselves drawing, uh, one of the thing is you have to be more stationary if you're gonna do a time lapse because you don't want the video like shaking constantly or like moving and this has been one of the biggest challenges for me to like not move around or like uh, change the viewing angle so it was a lot more fun when I was just you know I got to watch movies in the background I was drawing uh, at my own pace but now it's it's more specific but I hope you guys enjoy doing these because I I really like doing material studies and I think they they really strengthen your your sense of <clears throat> how materials work. Okay, really quick. I'm going to... I'm going to merge that down. Okay, so you can see how the left candle is lit, but something doesn't feel right. And the first thing is that it's not affecting the material around it. So on the second candle, we're going to light that one as well. And I'm just going to affect the surface. 
Now, mind you, I'm not doing subsurface scattering yet. I'm only affecting the actual surface of the wax. So as I do that, we can get another question. I was going to say, we have a couple of really awesome questions. Uh, I can't pronounce this name because it's Greek. Um, but it says, hello from Greece. Do you think uh, a Cintiq would help me paint more efficiently than an Intuos Pro, for example? Is what? Would, uh, would a Cintiq help paint more efficiently than an Intuos? It depends on what you're trying to achieve. I know if we're doing like line art or being more precise, yes. Yeah. I think it's it's much more useful. But in terms of painting, I still feel like I don't have enough experience with this antique to give a full answer. But I I feel very comfortable painting with my tablet. And I know I've heard some complaints of people that have Cintiqs that like your hand gets in the way and that can get kind of annoying. But like I said, I'm not going to be getting mine until early next year. So I guess once I have more experience and I, I play with it more, then I'd be able to give you a more solid answer. I did some research, more research on it this morning. Apparently they're having like a $200 sale off of some of the models. For Cyber Monday? I don't know if it was Cyber Monday, but they're having it right now. Oh, seriously? Yeah. I was, I was looking at it and I was like, I don't know if the 22 has one though. But the companion to 512 gigabyte has $200 off. And I was like, oh, I kind of want to get this. <laughs> it's $500 off? Uh, 200 Oh, 200 <clears throat> Yeah. That's tough. I, I still don't think I want the companion. Yeah, I, I think, haven't really thought about it. I don't think I want the companion. I think I, I would like that one just for ease of access. And I can you know move around the house. And oh, that's not, right. You don't have a laptop. Not be locked up in this tower all day. <laughs> that's where you belong. <laughs> Back. Yes, master. You ring the bell. It's a good and <laughs> self-fulfilling job. <laughs> um, Kataklava asks, when did you <laughs> Wait, what? I'm just imagining every time it's Wednesday when the live stream is about to start, you start <laughs> ringing this like giant bell up there and you're like shouting out the window, live stream's beginning. Hold on. <laughs> like no one in Waksha has any idea what you're talking about. Is there? Oh, there is a gong. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, that's, no. That's, that's, that's wrong. <laughs> it looks like a symbol. <laughs> <laughs> the live stream has begun. Sounds like a Mortal Kombat tournament. <laughs> <laughs> that too. Dun, 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 dun. Uh, anyway, sorry. Uh, oh, where did that? I had a question on here. I may have. It may have closed it. Um. Uh, okay, it's from Cataclava. It says, when did you figure out how to paint and stop using line art? What I mean is, when did you start discovering that objects didn't have line art around them, and you, and what did you study to help you see that? When was the first time I recognized that? To be honest, I think one of my teachers was telling me. Uh, I was such a control freak, and I still think I am, but I was able to adapt the idea of a lost edge and I remember that being like a really big deal for me because I always had everything outlined completely or I always had it surrounded completely. And the idea of just letting the edge kind of fade into the background and then picking up on a different part of the uh, subject matter, it was kind of liberating to be honest. And now I feel so much more free in allowing myself not to completely finish an edge if I don't feel it adds anything to the piece. And... Uh, in terms of like painting, I remember very specifically, I was working at the library and I was doing another one of my swordplay character run throughs for like the ninth time. But I started with line art and one of my library coworkers that uh, we, I don't know if we were friends, but he would always give it to me pretty straight. Like he would be brutally honest. And he just came up to me. He's like, that's not how it works in the industry. No one, you just go straight into color. He's like, the sooner you adapt this, the better of an artist you'll be. But until then, you're just uh, hampering yourself. Or something where it was just very direct. And <laughs> I just remember thinking, like, no, you don't know what it's like, thinking that I did, even though I didn't. And uh, the next piece I did, just to like kind of spite him, I did it with outline art to show that you need line art to like 
compose a strong silhouette. But surprise, surprise, it actually turned out a lot better when I just worked uh, straight from a silhouette with outline art, and I just used that as like my base, and I worked from that. And then for like the next year, I that's how I kind of drew everything. And you might not have like the same exact experience, but I think there will come a time where you experiment with something you uh, like refused to before, and you grow so much from it. So if maybe this is your point where go try without line art on your next piece, creating a really strong silhouette, and then working on that, and don't line it out, and see if you surprise yourself. All right, really quick, because I want to make sure that we keep in time with the stream, too. Is that on its own? Where is that candle? Oh, there it is. OK. So on the second candle, you can see how, yeah, the light is falling on the surface of the the wax. And actually, that yellow is too strong. Let me damper that. There we go. But the wax itself still feels really flat. It doesn't feel like that light source is really affecting it the way that we have come to know that it does. And it's really cool that our mind can see that something's not right. And when you're able to do that, then you're able to start the process of, OK, well, what can I do to fix it? Because I really do believe, as a concept artist, uh, we're given a lot of problems. How to draw this? Can you add that? And it's our job to be the, the problem solver, to bring up solutions. And for this one, I know, looking at it, I need to have that light permeate the surface of the wax and travel down. So that's what I'm going to do. Where did it go? It was from Sean Kelly. Uh, Sean Kelly says, I'm trying to render and blend as best as I can with my paintings, but I lose, but it looks like when I render, I lose a lot of texturing. How would you balance between the two and render your paintings but keep the texture? Oh, man, that's been like my biggest struggle the past year is uh, I've, ad I've adapted more of a chalk brush aesthetic to my work, but I, it, it fights that fully rendered part of my brain that wants everything to be smooth. So to be honest, it's not an easy challenge. And if you're like me in that sense, uh, it you almost have to force areas to let the brush strokes be seen and be OK with it. Be like, yes, this adds to the visual interest of the piece, even though it's not completely smooth. So it's kind of like you're contrasting your own logic. But uh, the more that you kind of let being so strict, uh, I think your pieces will will shine more. It'll become more loose, and in that sense, you'll you'll see more of a confidence. I was gonna say, I think I, I'm 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 liking more and more pieces that understand to take breaths, and you know, like as far as like rendering out things go, um, mm -hmm. and they oftentimes kind of look a little bit work in progressy, but it just to me, there's something that's really fresh about seeing that just like this point of focus is so rendered and then everything else is just kind of you know not as rendered but i still understand what it is you know oh yeah i really like that right now too uh kenneth stone asks i use sigh and want to know of a good way to texture and create a palette for original work i generally eventually wash things out and make it muddy at my current level that's um, a good yeah, if, as far as Psy goes, uh, texturing with that is a bit more difficult. You'd probably have to figure out how to uh, make certain brushes. Uh, there's also the idea that you you could be using the same way that Photoshop does the overlay layers with it. Um, Psy has a really good in-depth brush maker. It's just complicated to uh, want to explain right now. Uh, in a short amount of time, but there I know that there are online websites that do show you how to make brushes um, So definitely check those out If you get the chance I also use the fine flat brush for texture with a lot of my stuff to be given that painter painterly look the fine flat brush <clears throat> All right really quick so these are the three examples of the first one where you add a light 
but there's no light adaptation to the material itself, and it feels really weird. And it's like the light is traveling, like our mind know that the light should travel, but it's not being reciprocated on the material itself. The second one, okay, yeah, there might be uh, the initial pass on the material, but we know that the candle material itself, the light would permeate the surface. And if you aren't sure if something does or doesn't, uh, look at reference photos and even, oh, actually, that was the one thing I was going to show you guys. Hold on. Um, in front of me, oh, you know what? Now the sun comes out. I've been complaining the past three days that I can't record, and now the sun comes out. Anyways, so we have these Baker examples in front of me, and actually I can use the sun. Oh, you probably can't see it, though, clearly. But you guys can actually see through this. Yeah, yeah it's kind of hard to see on the thing. Let me use the light example from my phone again. So we actually found uh, a sphere candle and a cylinder candle. And, oh, maybe it's too bright. Oh, sun, how you're letting me down today. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to turn the flashlight back on my phone. All right, so on this candle, let me find a good spot where the sun isn't. There we go. All right, so you can see how if the light... Oh, come on. Oh, wait, wait. There we go. All right. So when the light is right behind the candle, you can't really see too much subsurface scattering. But as we get to the thinner areas, so if I did it more from like the edge, oh, it's still kind of hard to see on the video. Uh, I'll take photos so you guys can see this better and I'll upload them. But essentially, this edge is a lot more illuminated than this edge. And it's because the light source is on this thinner patch, there's less material that it, the light has to pass through to get to our eyes. And that's why I, I can't believe the sun is actually out right now. I'm, <laughs> I'm like disgusted. <laughs> but that was the example where if you're not sure, go test it out in real life. And uh, for me, this was always a very important thing to take your own reference photos. Yeah, Google Images help, but having the actual structure, the physical presence of the material in front of you can make such a difference because then you have the ability to uh, almost create your own scene, your own logic. So if you want a light, one point light system, you can and you just throw that object in the scene. If you wanted to like, if you were doing a first study for example, uh, you can put it in a way that is how, like you can mat it, you can put it in a different direction. And even things with like, like gold, something that would be a little more tougher to do if you wanted a specific object or if you wanted to see how light interacts with something as difficult as a metallic surface, uh, it becomes a lot easier when you have that physical presence that you can study from. And uh, I really do believe that you should take your own reference photos if you're able to. I know that sometimes you don't always have the means to do it, or if you want to do something like a sci-fi spaceship, it might be a little harder, but then break it down into what those individual materials are and try to find reference of that alone. All right, let me switch back here. And we will get into our ear. Um, All right, so yeah, what I was saying, oh, sorry. The second one was where it only affects the surface, and the third one is subsurface scattering. So you can see how the light passes through the object, and the further down it gets, it loses its its strength because it's bouncing around so heavily up here that after a while it loses each each. I think the way my teacher taught me was each bounce it loses a percentage of strength. So by the time it makes its way all the way down here, it's going to be very little strength, and it eventually you won't see much at all of the light permeating the surface. But it'll have this nice gradient effect of the uh, the light passing through. All right, so as I get the new scene started, let's go ahead and do another question. Uh, so, subject go, I think. Uh, do you think that using subsurface materials with 3D objects is good enough to use reference for drawing? Yes and no. I think it, because it heavily depends on the light uh, renderer that you're using. I know with Blender, oh, what's that called? It's not the... Luminous engine, I can't re I can't remember off the top of my head, but there's one render that oh, I can't think of what it's called. 
but I, from what I know, it, it creates this really beautiful look that uh, it mirrors real life. And I think that if you can render a material with uh, that, and if you did like a candle and the light source was emitting light the way it should, then yeah, I think using 3D is fine. I just think if you want it as true to life or true to form as possible, then I would use a real life render. Or sorry, a real life example. Yeah. Actually, what's funny is that there's on the Wikipedia definition of subsurface scattering, um, they use an image uh, of the the Susan, uh, the monkey oh, from Blood Yeah, uh, and they use it for an example of subsurface sc subsurface scattering uh, made in Blender. Believe it. See if I can find a quick ear here. Oh, that's a fun ear. Okay. Alex B says it's Lux or Cycles. Cycles render in Blender. Is yeah. Blender's become so strong in the past few years. <laughs> Here's a good question. Iron Matt asks, is there an, any art style or type of art that you just can't stand? <laughs> yes, and I will not share it. <laughs> <laughs> Conversation uh, for another time. I don't, I don't want anyone to get offended, but I think everyone has their own personal taste. I think it would be lying if someone said they didn't have a style that they were just like, I don't know, just not quite as fond of. So I, I think, yeah, there's definitely styles I'm not a big fan of, but... That doesn't mean I, I can't still respect the amount of time that that artist put into it and the the quality behind the understanding, like things like that. Then I, I I look to appreciate more than the actual end result. <laughs> respect the hustle. <laughs> mm. uh, Lost in Canada asks: Earlier, you said that areas in light are typically less saturated than areas in shadow. Why is this different when working with subsurface scattering? So when working with subsurface scattering, uh, no, it's actually the same. Wait, hold on. Let me find my example. Oh, no, no, no. I think, yeah, this is going to get, a, hopefully this doesn't get too confusing. So let me go ahead and scrape example. Or no, you know what? I'll use the hand example. All right. So the areas in light would be, and I won't even choose like the really obvious light source. We'll do one that's more, in between. So if this was the skin color here, and this would be more of like, or we'll say that's more of the shadow. This is the subsurface scattering red. All right, just looking at these, and you know what? Maybe we will throw in a lighter skin one. We'll put it here. All right, so, oh, you guys can't see my color picker. Uh, you know what? I'll make this full screen. Let me reshare this out. All right, so ignore the little eyes on the bottom of the, oops. That's my ear reference that I'm using. There we go. All right, so when I pull up the color picker, so the area that is in light, you can see on the saturation scale, which is the horizontal one, remember, it is kind of like at a 25 to 30% range. So then as we get into the shadow, you can see it's super saturated. It's actually at 66%. Uh, and you know what? Maybe I'll write these down next to them. So it's 27. And then the red, that is the subsurface scattering, is crazy saturated. So this would be at 86%. So when working with subsurface scattering, the idea is... Uh, it's you can't just think of it as area in light and area in shadow because this is permeating the surface and it's from a light source and uh, it I, I learned this from a gold tutorial that I watched or I saw online and it's the idea that if light bounces on itself it becomes more saturated so the area that is inside of the shadow becomes more saturated because it's bouncing on itself. Now, I think where it got confusing was with the gummy bear. 
Let me pull that back up. Where are you, gummy? Oh, you're hidden. That's why. Wait, let me. <laughs> right, pull you back on the scene. All right, so let's do the same test with the gummy bear. So we'll say the area where the light is hitting the surface, what seems to be the hue identity, area in shadow, oops, area in shadow, subsurface scattering, and then the area that actually lands in the the object shadow. All right, so now if we look at, and you can kind of see just from on this scale, this red is going to be super saturated. And the area that's in shadow is actually very saturated as well. But then as we get to the, the middle of the, the gummy area, you can see how it loses just a hint. And then as we get to the surface, a lot is lost. And it's the idea that an area in light is less saturated than an area in shadow. Now it becomes a little, like you have to think of a next step when working with subsurface scattering because then there's color that lands, that typically lands in the shadow. So you can see how it loses some of the saturation even from the shadow color, but with the local color or the hue identity of the gummy bear, it should be rather similar. So you can see between these two, it's very, very similar. So it, it really does vary per object, but as a typical rule of thumb, you can just always remember that an area in light tends to be less saturated than an area in shadow. And with subsurface scattering, it becomes this whole nother step because then where it becomes super saturated is typically within the material. And then as it lands in the, the actual, actual shadow, it will become less saturated. So I'm hoping that wasn't too confusing. Uh, I know subsurface scattering is just a cool effect that sometimes takes a, a few tries to get comfortable working with. I'm going to switch back to just my, my canvas here. All right, we got two questions that are higher up on the pluses. And okay. this one uh, kind of still goes with subsurface scattering. Uh, Tigel asks, subsurface scattering depends obviously on the material, but how much does the type of light matter? Is there a kind of light that works better for subsurface scattering, like sunlight, artificial light, fire, etc.? Does the color hue of the light matter? Yes. Uh, typically with like a fire or the sun or a candle, you're going to get more of a warm presence. And obviously it depends on the object you're working with, but typically when we think of subsurface scattering, it's with like skin. And since our skin has the red blood vessels that is being uh, kind of illuminated from the light, it does create this very warm effect, especially when the light source is a warmer color. And actually, I, I almost want to challenge you to uh, do the same test of like the light behind the ear, but do it with like a green light or a blue light or a purple light and see what the effect is. And maybe we'll do that test here and include that in the, in the material course as well. Because it will be slightly different, but it's still bouncing around the red blood vessels. So it's that initial color plus the red will equal the result. Street Dragon 95 asks, how do you bounce colors with two different light sources? For example, a yellow campfire with blue moonlight, especially when coloring stuff like skin under these kinds of conditions. Then you're getting into like extreme uh, light sources, and it's like you're isolating different areas. Now wait one second. Let me. I'm trying to find a really good example of a uh, ear being subsurface scattered. But when you're working with those extremes, you are. It's not so much working with like uh, a filler light. There really is no filler light. There might be like a slight filler. But essentially, you have like two isolated lights. You have this really cool 
uh, moonlight and then this really warm, if it's like a campfire or something, uh, secondary light. And you have to balance them out and make sure that where you're placing those lighting uh, falls in placement with how the form is shaped. And if those aren't consistent, it'll ruin the entire piece. So that's a that's like a real big challenge. And I would first try to learn how to work with one and then step it up with two, but have like a filler. And then if you want to take it more extreme where you're working with like uh, lighting scenarios that aren't so typical. You still there? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Your mic was getting a little bit like. <laughs> We're still looking for an example. Yeah, I, I should have just taken my own reference. See, this is the problem of having to rely on Google image search. Doesn't always give you the exact result that you want. Uh, that's okay. I'm just gonna. I can wing it. I'm trying to think of an image that comes to mind. Was your your League of Legends one like that with Ziggs? Yeah, team? that was like that was tough. Because the explosion was yellow lit. And then yeah, there was a moonlight, wasn't there? Mm -hmm. Oh, Google image search. You would disappoint me right now. Hi. Right. I mean, is there another question I could get while I start this one? Yeah. Um, Evie says, I'm having difficulties with subsurface scattering if there are things like bones with the material that's being lit. Any tips for that? Like bones. Uh, I guess you just have to take into account the bones and how those don't uh, absorb light the same way like skin would. So you almost have like this inner shadow and it, it could create like this really cool effect where uh, you can tell that it's like you're implying that there's a form inside of the form but it, it won't be treating light in the same way. Yeah, I was going to say, it's kind of like an x-ray, right? Mm-hmm. Just give me a heads up. we got about nine minutes left, unless you want to go over. We'll probably have to go over a little bit. Okay. Do, 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 do. Did you want to know you were great at answering questions, but and you seem to know so much. But what questions do you have? What are some things you would love to learn more about? What happens after we die? <laughs> nice. Man. Uh, man, the biggest questions I have. I would say painting environments uh, quickly and efficiently. That would be one thing I I would really want to do more research on. Um. I'm always intrigued by color theories, so anything color related, I'm usually uh, intrigued by. Yeah, I would say those are the two big ones for me. Alex B asks, do you use a tablet when working in Photoshop? I do. What's the tablet that you use? It is a Wacom Intuos 4 but I hate that base layer color. All right, we're gonna we're gonna try doing something a bit different. Pink. Pink. We're gonna make this color work. That's gonna be the challenge. Uh, Kenneth Stone asks, how often do you make your own palette versus using reference to build it? Um, I have a set swatch palette that is kind of like my go-to, and I use that for a lot of things, but. A lot of the times I am using a reference that I found uh, online or um, a mixture of a different of a few different references, usually like 10 to 20 minimum, and I usually color pick from those. Mm. 
Pigeon wants to know if you could turn into a, into a fly, who would you spy on? <laughs> who would I spy on? Uh, if you guys know, I'm pretty intrigued by pop culture, but I feel like I wouldn't want to spy on them because it would just be really sad. I think almost every pop artist is just really depressed. So if I had to be, if I had to really think, it would be probably one of the artists I am just curious about their process and how they go about doing things. So like Alan Williams, I would love to just see on a day-to-day -day basis, like how he works and uh, like does he go out to draw? Does he say, does he have like a studio that he mainly kind of confides himself in? I guess those would be my my big two that I would be a fly on the wall for. My answer is everyone. <laughs> uh, Micah asks, do you guys already have tickets to the Star Wars movie? I do not. I actually just saw the last movie on Sunday. I'm one of those people that I have waited <laughs> a little too long to finish the entire uh, series, but um, I'm excited for the new one. I think it looks pretty good, but I I definitely don't think I'm as big of a fan as like Joe. <laughs> to answer your question, yes, I do have my tickets, <laughs> <laughs> and yes, I will be dressing up. Since I'm seven two, I'll be going as Chewbacca. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Ari Phillips asks, is there going to be bubblegum in the material course? There could be. It won't be with the initial launch, though. I'm trying to get at least the core materials in there. So right now on my list, like frosting kind of like worked its way in, but I don't know if that's a core material. But uh, dry leather, wood, skin, and gold are the ones for sure on my list. And then the next ones after that are chrome, glass, lemon, and frosting, but since I already did the frosting one, that's going to be in there. And then from that point forward, it's going to be a lot of like, I really do think it's going to be like once every three months, I'll give like a booster pack of uh, liquids or uh, in this case, like uh, confectionery things or candy. So like bubblegum would be an awesome one to do. Actually, I would I'd love to do bubblegum. And then for like the uh, taking it a step further, like having an entire head made out of bubblegum, I think that would be a cool uh, material study. Uh, Alex B wants to know, did you say Wacom H204? Uh, Intuos 4? I-N-T-U-O-S. And Laser first said, can touchpad Wacom tablets work for 3D animation, and what tablet do you use? And then said, hey, that guy stole my question. <laughs> uh yeah, from what I remember when I was in school, we had to use uh, mouses, but I don't see what the disadvantage to using a tablet would be. I, I do think it would be more efficient to use a mouse, to be completely honest, but uh, that I mean, that could just be a personal preference thing. With animation? Because like, then you're sliding bars constantly or like moving pieces. I could see where you could do it with a tablet, I guess. It would be it'd be cool if if we had 3D like virtual reality like if you had like like if you could use two hands at once to to like pose something. No. But <laughs> but like using a, I think using a tablet's probably not that great for animation. It's better for sculpting. Uh, I would say, and then yeah, I'd say mouse is probably what I would use. Yeah, I would use a mouse. You wouldn't use like, like gloves that no, uh, that were like uh, like you know how they did the Paranorman ones, like how they pose them and stuff. Nope. I don't know. I wouldn't say I'm against future things. I just I'm not inclined by it at all. <laughs> <laughs> I think like drawing. I just like the feel of the instrument in my hand having a physical. I think that's why I've been so. Uh, like doing traditional stuff more than digital lately. I just feel there's a presence there that's missed when it becomes too digital. There's like a lack of humanity behind it, I feel. 
but maybe that's what people are going for. So I don't know. <laughs> or just ease. <laughs> they just want it to be easier. I think the idea is cool, but in practicality, it's not easier. Because then you're like constant. It's like a workout. Like think of doing that for like an hour. Oh, that'd be awesome. <laughs> I'm, I'm I, for it. You're, I, I, know think it, I think it's very gimmicky, but I could be wrong, and I could just be um, too biased, I guess. It's too early to tell. Uh, Alex B asks, any plans for a perspective or anatomy course in the future, or is that something that comes with practice? Actually, we have a perspective course coming out next month, and that will be Joel's first full course at CG Cookie. Yes, I will be doing a perspective course. Uh, it will be covering the outline up. The outline is one point perspective, uh, managing the horizon line, two point perspective, uh, and then like working in perspective. So like depth and measuring for shortening, uh, building complex objects, things like that, curves line or curves and cylinders. So it'll be fun. It'll be good. I know a lot of people are, a lot of people have asked for a perspective course. Um, so hopefully it'll help. So what about anatomy though? Anatomy we're planning for next summer, I think is when me and Wes talked about. Because I think that is just such a fun course that like everyone would enjoy seeing, but I want to make sure it's done right. And then to do that, I have to dedicate the proper time to the courses we're getting out now first. Oh no, I think Photoshop just quit on me. Oh geez. Don't quit me. Oh, there we go. That was weird. <laughs> I'll work on this for like another five minutes. Uh, Ari Phillips says, when I draw, my poses always lack of movement. Even in life drawing, it looks not fluid or not in motion and lifeless. Oh, is that the question? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, you probably have the same problem I have where you make things too stiff. Uh, they feel uh, more static in comparison to something being more dynamic. So what you could do is just try being more loose with your brush strokes, having more of a continual stroke rather than it being a uh, very like a scratch, scra uh, what is it called, Cri uh, chicken scratch look to it. So I guess for an example, have your lines be like more fluid and bold and conf when you're doing your strokes, be more confident rather than doing like, you were doing an arm and you were doing like really quick little strokes to try to represent your arm and then you get into the hand. There, there comes a time where this is, it's bad because then you aren't, it's like adjusting to your lack of confidence. So what you should be doing more is working more with like shape language and Letting things be more exaggerated because you know that you'll be able to uh, pull them down later on. I think you also become a faster artist too, really. Yeah, there's a in a book that I was reading called Force. They talk about the idea of uh, like the Michelin Man, how it like, kind of has like when it's like rounded, how it looks kind of like a like if we were to draw a head on top of head on top of head so they're like these circles or ovals on top of each other to make like an arm it reads extremely flat and that's why uh like if things are very symmetrical they look rather flat as well mm, yeah Uh, Alex B says, no nudes in the anatomy course, please. <laughs> uh, no promises. Yeah. Uh, I guess the, and I guess maybe on more serious note, I remember one of my classmates and actually one of my good friends when I was in college, she had a, a kind of a fear of drawing naked people. And it was the idea of seeing someone in the nude. And I remember, I think it only took one or two classes where, not only did she kind of get over that fear, but she adapted really well. And she saw the body for it being more of like a reference of beauty and looking at form rather than it just being like a naked 
uh, body. It wasn't like this. Uh, what's a good word? It wasn't erotic in any way, and I think that's there's a difference with life drawing, and I think that's why the human form can be considered art, but definitely, you know, dances on that fine line of being artistic or being sexually arousing. And if we did an anatomy course, I don't think we would include nudes, but uh, if there were ones that would be a bit more suggestive, I, we will do it in a more uh, conservative manner. It won't be for, uh, <laughs> I guess, an, a bad intention purpose. Uh, teacher asks, will there be boxes involved in my perspective course? I'll be disappointed if there wouldn't be. Of course there'll be boxes. You have to put people in boxes all the time. <laughs> uh, uh, this is a question that's related to the level up guys, I believe. Uh, Dave T asks, Tim and Joe, would you rather be a Godzilla? Would you rather be Godzilla or a billionaire and why? A billionaire. I'd get bored of destroying cities. <laughs> do I, I don't know why that sounded like so the, like, confident and like well thought out. <laughs> no. Do I have the ability to turn into Godzilla and then turn or am I just Godzilla? Because if I'm just Godzilla, Godzilla no. Like if I could like turn into Godzilla and fight super ultra mega monsters, then that would be awesome. Of this is a uh, a rather philosophical question. Uh, it's from Tigel. It says, "Any artist, or what are your thoughts on any an artist that puts so much of himself in his own work as reflection of who he slash she is?" When the art speaks to people, they recognize parts of themselves in that art. So I think that art is a perfect for finding true friendship and relationship. What are your thoughts? I fully agree. I think that's why sometimes when we get disappointed in the artists that we really follow, like if they quote unquote sell out, it does reflect their personality and who they are and what they believe in. And I think almost all art is a reflection. If that, I, I really do think all art is a reflection of the artist that created it. And even if like someone copied another person's art and then like try to claim it as their own, like that should, that says a lot about their personality that they uh, see that as you know it's not morally deconstructive to take someone else's work and claim it as their own. And uh, even the the styling or the the quality level really it is a reflection of either them or how hard they've worked or uh, it, it, there's definitely a difference with artists that work fast or the ones that take their time, and it definitely reflects on their personality, especially with, like, my old work. I can definitely see, like, how much of my, like, OCD can be seen and carried in to my older pieces. And I think to this day I still have a little bit of a problem with that, but I try to be more loose, and I think that that shows a lot more about me and where I've been in my life the past few years to where I am now. And... I, I really do believe that art is re a reflection of the artists themselves. I am almost done. And I'll show you guys a reference because you're probably like, what the heck are you drawing? Some people are talking about anatomy now and life drawing. Uh, Faith Newman says, what would you suggest if you cannot draw nudes because personal beliefs are being unable to see sexual, see it sexually? Wait, what would you suggest if you cannot draw nudes as a person? Um, well, that's I, I feel like that falls into my friend's perspective, and she really was against it. But then once she did it, I guess it really does come down to the intention. Like, why are you drawing this? Why are you 
uh, you know, studying a nude. And if it really is to just study form and really look at it from a pure art perspective, then I don't think that would interfere with your personal beliefs. I think it's when you start to uh, make it into a problem, that's when it, it, like it won't, you can't shake that idea that it is uh, more of a sexual thing. You almost have to force yourself to see it purely from an art perspective and nothing more, which I know that can be really hard. And if that is something that you're, you're not fully comfortable with, you know, maybe take the time to really figure out why you feel that uh, way or that like why you feel so uh, passionate about that and try to find a way to make it work. I don't know if it would be like looking at 3D models and uh, maybe studying the, those, but I really do think studying from life is the best way to get uh, the best anatomy reference. All right, let me show you guys the reference really quick and then we will go ahead and cut the stream. So I just took a picture because I couldn't find a good one on Google, so I just took a picture really quick of me taking one from behind my ear, color picking, and that's what that giant red block is on the side. That's the back of my phone. And that was the study I did. So, all right, let me look through the questions really quick. But I, I really do think that if you guys want to learn more about subsurface scattering, you have to do a few exam not only a few, you have to do a lot of different examples and experiments, and they're fun. Material studies are really, really fun. And once you're able to have like a, a good proper amount of knowledge behind each material, so in this case, subsurface scattering, when you're doing your characters or if you're doing something that would have it, like candlelight, if something's being lit by candlelight, you already know going into that what different tools you should be using, what the look should be, what the end result should look like, and how that light affects the area around it. All right, let me look through the <laughs> first one I see is just start by drawing yourself naked. Uh, that's a statement that I actually do believe. I will not never show, but I remember in college, I would just take pictures of myself for reference. And I would wait until I know no one was in the apartment, and I would just kind of have a field day with different poses, and it would be for a bunch of different characters. I would try to get different angles. And if you're not comfortable doing nude, I remember I did a lot of just being in my, my boxers, and that's the anatomy that I would reference from. Okay, from Super, maybe I'll, I'll try to find three good questions. So this one's from Super 100 Miki. I think I missed it, but how to identify an object's local color? I constantly mistake it with its influence with the light, shadow, et cetera. Does local color have its properties? So uh, you're... I hope I wasn't being too confusing earlier, but local color is different from a hue identity. So like even in this painting that I just did, the hue identity of my skin is not this crazy pink uh, color that you see inside of the ear. The local color is this crazy pink color. So the hue identity of the my skin would probably be something more of like this muted purple color. And that's because of the, or no, I'm sorry, even that would be local color. My skin color should be influenced in a very neutral lighting scenario, and that's what the true hue identity of an object is. The local color is influenced by the lighting around it. So the reason my skin looks so purple is because I was being lit from the outside, and it was cloudy at the time, so it was creating this bluey, a light source and then mixing with my more red skin tone it created this purplish look and then the subsurface scattering is being greatly affected by that little light source in my phone and that's what's giving these pink uh, these really hot magenta pink colors so these are all considered local colors the true hue identity of let's say my skin would probably be something let me see if I can whip a color up really quick would probably be something more like this. Or even, I have a bit more of like a red based skin. Probably something like, yeah, that's too, that's too dark. Right there, there we go. So that's, this is probably my true hue identity. And the local colors would be these here. So 
I'll try to explain it better with the course, but just know there's a huge difference between the hue identity of an object and the local color. So uh, just remember that there is a big difference. Let's see here. Um, Tishel, if my arms or hands would become completely paralyzed, what would I do if I wasn't able to start drawing anymore? Would I use my feet? How do you earn a living? Uh, to be honest, I'd probably just teach for a living. And as long as I can still talk, I could still share at least what I feel like I've accumulated over the years in terms of my knowledge of art. But it would be incredibly devastating if I wasn't able to create art anymore. I would probably f try to figure out a way to do it. Uh, I don't know if my feet would be the most practical. I think with technology nowadays, hopefully I could have just like a mechanical arm of some kind. As long as I can get a pencil to paper, uh, I'd be fine. Even if I had to use, uh, I don't know what kind of appliance I would use, but somehow I would still try to create art. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, will we get a Christmas drawing next month? You absolutely will. If there's actually something you want to see specifically that's Christmas related, uh, I'd be more than willing to draw that on the stream. Because even something like, I don't know if I'd want to draw a Christmas tree, but uh, an ornament with like a golden ornate hook, uh, what are those, the topping? the topper of the ornament, like though that could be really fun to draw. Or even the ornament itself and how it reflects the environment. Or maybe a snowman. Maybe I'll draw a snowman. <laughs> uh, Alex says, so if the human body is art, does that mean you would say someone created it? I would say, but I would say two. Uh, how do you go for light going through leaves? That is a, another great example of subsurface scattering. But typically, you see uh, it from the underside. You don't see it so much if you looked at it from the top. And that's a whole other uh, material video that I could talk about, where the top of the leaf would be seen as it reflects light. But if you looked at it from underneath, you would see it absorb and uh, have the subsurface scattering effect. Let me try to find one more. <laughs> well, OK, we'll end with uh, a statement from C-N. C -N. Uh, it says, Tim, we're all glad you challenge your discomfort of drawing in front of people, talking while you draw. Your lessons are all incredibly helpful and insightful. I enjoy every lesson. And Joe is fun to have around, too. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. <laughs> Okay. Let me turn this off. Okay. Thank you guys for coming to this live stream. The only announcement I have is that we are going to be launching uh, a few courses over the next month and a half. First, with the materials and texture course, which should be out next week. I'll give you updates on if it needs to be pushed back, but I really am trying to aim for the Tuesday. We'll see if that happens, but I'm going to work for it. Joe's perspective course, which remember. And then we have an entire game asset course, which will start in concept and end in Unity, where it explains how to take a basic game asset. And I think we're going to be sticking with a boulder, starting it in concept, giving it to a modeler in 3D, and having the 3D model then be brought into a game engine, uh, Unity more specifically, and to have it be, be fully functional. And it'll, that will be the start of a bunch of tutorials we're planning to show you guys how you can make a game. And we're going to start with this small game asset, and we're going to move it into dynamic asset, and then into a character, and then that will get into more animation as well. And I think that is the main gist of what I wanted to tell you guys. So thank you for coming. We do these every Wednesday at 2 PM Central Time. And next week, we'll probably do special materials. Or if there's something specifically you want to see, uh, we can do that as well. It might be wood, actually, now that I think of it. It's either going to be something crazy like iridescence or something more solid like uh, wood or uh, what was the other one that I had here? Uh, no, we did leather. 
Or maybe we'll do something fun like a lemon, and I'll show you how to squish that into different forms, and that might be kind of fun to do. All right. Take care, everyone. Joey, have any last words? Yeah. <laughs> yeah that was it. All right. Thank you guys for coming. Bye. Hopefully we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye guys. <laughs>